Brian Baker. I'm the VP of Education and Principal Historian here. On behalf of all of us here at the Hall of Fame, thank you for Zooming in. Thank you for uh, the students who are joining us here live today. Uh, we wish all of you could be here and uh, in the future, we'll certainly make an effort to do that. Uh, we're uh, just a couple of our, our VIPs are, are joining us right now, including Mrs. Welburn. Uh, she's going to cut across your view for just a second. Forgive that. All right. Anyway, thanks for thanks again for being here. Um, we're going to get started now so that you have a chance to uh, to um, to think about what we're doing during this. We will be monitoring the chat room for those of you who are zooming in with us. And if you have some questions you'd like to ask. We have a limited amount of time, but we will make our efforts to uh, follow up with you if we don't have time for yours while we're on camera. But again, I wanna, wanna start with welcoming you to the Hall of Fame here. And uh, this place, uh, it means a lot to, to us and to those individuals who are here. Um, the, uh, the, the fact that this began in 1939 at the New York World's Fair as a conversation between Henry Ford, Eddie Rickenbacker, and some of the other founding fathers and it has evolved to more than 250 inductees here with uh, annual honorees and, uh, and such, and including uh, student interns, uh, a couple of whom are helping us out today. Um, forgive me, I'm gonna reach here for a moment to advance. I wanna start by saying thank you to uh, the Lawrence Fisher Fund uh, obviously the Motor City's National Heritage uh, folks who are here with us today and the BD and JE McIntyre Foundation, but also you for being here in person or on Zoom. Today's speaker is Edward Welburn. Ed is a many things. Uh, he's gonna talk about some amazing adventures he's had in his lifetime, but mostly uh, I wanna start by telling you about who this guy is. Uh, first of all, he's an inductee that we brought in in 2017, but he's a barrier breaker. This is a guy who you're going to see in his story, uh, the barriers that he broke through uh, at every level uh, from the time he was a child. He's uh, definitely an industry leader. Uh, his career speaks for itself and it continues to speak for itself. Uh, and finally, he is a master of reinvention. Uh, as, as you'll see, uh, what he's done since uh, his graduation, his phrase, not mine, I love it, uh, from General Motors, is astounding. And it continues to astound, and you're going to see results of that. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce Ed Welburn, who is important in our industry. He's important to us here at the Automotive Hall of Fame, and he's our friend here at the Hall but I also like to say he's my friend as well. Ed, please join us. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you, everyone. Um, I've really been looking forward to this day, I, and I got to thank Brian and everyone here at the Hall of Fame for all that they have done to bring this together. I'd like to thank Wayne Morical. Uh, and all of the people at General Motors Design that helped with images, some of them were kind of funny when, you, when we go through them, and uh, the vehicles that are, that are here today as well. I'm going to try to share with you my life's journey and some observations along the way. Um, in my career, I've been privileged to learn from and work with and lead some of the most gifted designers and sculptors in the world. I have watched young designers, some of which were just interns, grow, mature, and take on leadership positions in design. I have watched design organizations around the world that have grown and taken on incredible responsibilities as well. And I have been there when friends and co-workers have experienced great sacrifices and even personal tragedies. I have attended White House dinners when George W. Bush was uh, president. And I, and I took President Obama on a tour of a very special exhibit 
at the Washington DC auto show. When he saw this red Malibu, he instantly jumped in and I decided, well, I better run around and get in on the other side so I can explain the interior of this car. And when I ran around and got inside and we closed the doors, it was like all of a sudden, it was just me and the President of the United States. I mean, it was like, wow. It was unbelievable, it was an unexpected moment and well, it was unexpected to Secret Service as well. Their eyes got, got kind of big and, and all the, the journalists that were there and the photographers were snapping pictures like crazy. And the two of us actually had a very, we had a really, really special conversation. I started off by wanting to explain the interior and he just wanted to talk about me. I was surprised how much he knew about me. And we, we just talked about our careers, both of us. It was it's kind of emotional every time I see that picture, but I, I love that photograph. Um, I have presented new designs at auto shows in Germany, Russia, India, Brazil, Argentina, France, Thailand, Colombia, Geneva, Switzerland, South Africa, as well as here in the United States in Detroit. New York, LA, Philadelphia, and Chicago. I mean, even I have to say, wow, when I think back on all of those shows, all of those venues, and every one of them had a very different character and its own unique stories. I've met with government officials and leaders in Australia, China, Korea, South Africa, and Brazil. I never really thought that I would ever speak at, uh, you know, with government officials in Australia, in Parliament in Australia. That was quite an experience. And just as important, I have spent time with students at design schools in China, Korea, Australia, Colombia, England, and many schools here in America, as well as a very special visit to Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. I've received almost every award that a car designer can receive. And most important, I have watched my two children grow into incredible adults, and, and now I'm a grandfather. Um, but it hasn't all been champagne, roses, and puppy dogs, I must admit. I, too, have been confronted by police officers late at night and what without question was the scariest moment in my life. They didn't know who I was, they just, to have three police cars stop me on a very dark road in Sterling Heights was without a doubt the scariest moment of my life. I have had to face my own health issues and when my girlfriend, now wife, faced her own health challenges, I must admit I felt totally helpless. Thank goodness she has recovered. She is the love of my life and makes me laugh every day and makes me a much stronger person. But let's go back to my childhood. We're gonna go back to my childhood. I grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia, Berwyn, Pennsylvania. On this particular day in 1957, yes, in many ways I'm gonna date myself in this presentation. I was six years old and my mother and I were walking down this tree-lined road. It was the fall of the year and the leaves were bright colors of red and yellow and orange. And as we walked down this road, like other six-year-old kids, I was kicking up the leaves, and, which had landed on the ground. And suddenly, about a block ahead, a car emerged from a side street. It had a proportion like nothing I had ever seen. Even at age six, I knew this was something kind of different. As it turned in our direction and it was kicking up leaves just as I had been doing, uh, being just six years old, as that small sports car 
came past me, the headlight, you know, I couldn't help but notice the fact that it had this wire mesh over the headlamp and this metallic blue paint and the rumble of the exhaust was really kind of special. And it had these two tiny fins on the bullet tail lamp. And suddenly it was gone. It was the very first Corvette that I ever saw. And I will never forget that moment. It just stuck in my brain. That's how crazy it was about cars. As a kid, yes, I was crazy about cars. When other toddlers were drawing stick figures of people and I think we'll back up. I'm not sure if I'm off or not. Yeah. When other uh, kids were drawing stick figures of uh, horses and people and houses, I was drawing cars. Yes, there's a drawing that'll... Oh, so we'll skip that? Okay, so at any rate, as a kid, I was drawing cars all the time. I mean, just two and a half, three years old. And my parents would always have a stack of paper because they just thought it was entertaining to see me draw cars at such a young age. One day there was no paper around, so I don't know how I knew this, but I knew that the front page of a book was blank. So I went through my mother's extensive bookshelves with purple crayon and drew cars in all of her books. She was furious. I'll I, I think it's about the maddest I ever saw my mother. But years later, when I became you know, a big time car designer, my mother was proud to show those drawings to everyone. In fact, I still have some of those books with the drawings that I did at age three years old. Uh, at age nine, my parents took me to the Philadelphia Auto Show. And I loved the auto show. I mean, it was my Disneyland, my fantasy land. And as we walked through the shows, there was one car, and I think he had that image earlier, of the Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. And you can, yeah, there it, there it is. That is the actual, that's the, fifth, the Philadelphia Auto Show in the year that I went there, at age nine. And by that car that is, it's got its railing around it, I stood there by the, the front left fender of that car, and I was totally amazed by that car. It really struck me like nothing else at the auto show. And I told my parents, when I grow up, I want to design cars for that company. That company was Cadillac and the car was the Cadillac Cyclone. I was just nine years old when I made that decision that I wanted to design cars. I was a slow reader as a kid. My mother tried everything to help me. Book clubs and special classes on weekends and special classes in the summer. She tried everything. She knew my love for cars and began buying car magazines for me. She checked them out to make sure there weren't any naked women in it, but, you know, uh, but she knew I loved uh, cars. So by age 11, I had subscriptions to multiple car magazines, and I read them from cover to cover, and it was there that I learned where that Cadillac Cyclone was designed. And I wrote my first of numerous letters to General Motors Design asking them for information about careers in design, and they sent me a great response, great information. I was age 11. My father and his brothers had an auto body repair shop. It was dirty work, and he really didn't want me to get too involved in it or spend a lot of time there. And so I would spend a few minutes there almost every day, and then unbeknownst to him, I'd get on my bike and I'd ride to other shops and hang out at other shops around town. I'd go to the hot rod shop. I'd go to another body repair shop. I, I'd make a whole circle of it. He never knew. He never knew. 
my backyard was my shop where all the neighborhood kids brought their bikes for repair. And I do repair on there. Hey, it's crazy, you know. Uh, I went to a great high school in suburban Philadelphia, one of the best, and I excelled in math and science. I mean, I learned math that I've never used ever since then. Uh, but the art department was lacking. Uh, I, but I didn't know better. You know, I had nothing to compare it to. I just took a lot of art classes because I thought I needed it for design. I had nothing to compare it to. That said, I was on this mission to be a car designer. So, you know, I would put everything into the work I was doing. My parents were great people, and I'm so lucky, I mean, to have parents like that. And they did everything they could to support me in every way they could. But in a period of time in America where there were very few people of color to look up to, uh, and no blacks in TV and very few in the movies, Muhammad Ali was my superhero. Muhammad Ali made me feel proud to be black and caused me to walk taller and stronger. When there was adversity, his example helped me through it all. Senior year in high school, I applied to all of the leading design schools in America, and I received rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. I was stunned, shaken, but I wasn't broken. My mission of becoming a car designer was fading, and just as it was really becoming dim, I was accepted into the College of Fine Arts at Howard University in Washington, D.C. They didn't have a major in car design. Very few schools did at the time. But the professors there in product design, sculpture, and painting were supportive of my mission that I was on, and they did everything they could to help me reach my goal. I continued to be in communication with GM Design. Uh, this was before emails or any other technology. I mean, think about it. In that period of time, you write a letter, put an envelope, stamp it, put it in the mail, wait for two, maybe three weeks for a response. That was how we communicated back then, and that's how I communicated with General Motors, and, and they, were, they were great with their response. They had a great internship program, which I was accepted into, very prestigious summer design internship program, they still do, for students who had completed their junior year in college. My foot was now in the door at the place where I had dreamed of working since childhood, General Motors Design. It was an incredible, incredible learning experience. And on my last day as an intern, I was introduced to my automotive, one of my automotive heroes, General Motors Vice President of Design, Bill Mitchell. I love this photograph. I mean, look at that suit. I'm not talking about his suit. Look at my suit. I mean, <laughs> look at that hair. I'm not talking about his hair. Look at my hair in that picture. <laughs> it, uh, Later in that very same day, I was called into an office and I was told you know, to return to Howard University, complete my senior year, that they wanted to hire me. I couldn't believe it. You know, I just, I was, it's like, wow, this lifelong dream was coming closer and closer to, to happening. I entered GM Design in 1972 as the very first African American hired to design cars for the almighty General Motors design. I never celebrated that fact, that the fact that I was the first black person in that role, but I soon realized that I was representing more than myself. I realized that African Americans were being to be honest, we're being judged by my own performance as a designer and as a man. 
I was very lucky to spend most of my early years at GM in the Buick studios designing Buick Rivieras, an incredible car which I had admired for its sporty elegance. The people of design were very supportive and I learned a lot during those formative years. And to be honest, I'm, I'm still learning. I spent two years in the Buick studio and then I moved to the Oldsmobile studio where I spent much of my career primarily designing Cutlass Supremes. No, these are not digital renderings. This is all marker and chalk and Prismacolor and all that sort of thing. Uh, after about 15 years at GM, I became deeply engaged in the design, in a design program which would really change my career in many ways. It was Aerotech, a high-speed research vehicle with an Indy car chassis, 1,000 horsepower, driven by the legendary driver A.J. Foyt. Now, I know this young audience of, of designers, uh, probably, you probably don't know who A.J. is. Um, A.J. AJ Foyt is a very tough Texan race car driver who won the Indianapolis 500 four times. He won the Daytona 500, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. He raced sprint cars in a dirt track, you name it. He raced it and he won it. And a very tough guy and he and I really worked well together on this project. I designed a very slippery body for this vehicle and as well as the team's uniforms and the transporter. We set many world's records for speed and endurance with the car and I learned a lot about building relationships between a diverse group of designers, sculptors, engineers, and that very tough race car driver from Texas, AJ. The top speed approached 300 miles an hour. The wind tunnel became our design studio. There are no wings, no splitters, no spoilers or vortex generation, generators on the car at all. Just a perfectly shaped body with huge underbody ground effects tunnels. In the midst of all of that, I, was, I continued to design vehicles in the Oldsmobile studios. I was working on Aerotech at night and in the studio, working on other Oldsmobiles during the day, including the pace car for an Indianapolis 500. I was totally thrilled with what I was doing in design and put every bit of my energy into my craft. It was during this period that one of my bosses told me that I was doing a great job but I needed to face the fact that General Motors would never make a black person an executive in design. He was very serious and was actually trying to be helpful. And I, but I was rocked. I was absolutely rocked by what he was telling me. It was like I had been punched by a heavyweight boxer. I was on the ropes. Should I stay at GM Design? Should I look for a job elsewhere? Should I return to my hometown in Pennsylvania? What should I do? Once I cleared my head, which really took a couple days, I thought about my hero, Muhammad Ali, and I decided to keep pushing. Just one year later, I was actually promoted to an executive position, chief designer of the Oldsmobile studio. I was the first African American named in an executive position in automobile design, not just the GM, but in the auto industry in, in total. In the first 20 years at GM, I worked well with everyone and learned from many, but I never really had a mentor until I worked for Wayne Cherry. I credit Wayne for coining the term crossover vehicles. Of course, his vision was much more broad than the crossovers we have in the market today. 
at the time, he was the leader of GM Design, and he gave me a variety of, uh, of assignments, not all easy at all, including a year in the Saturn Design Studio and uh, one year assignment at GM Studios in Germany, then back to America to lead an advanced design studio where I had an opportunity to work with Brian Baker. Brian and I created a variety of progressive concepts in a cutting edge studio environment. I really credit Brian, Brian I credit you, for spearheading the development of that very, very cool advanced studio environment. I was then promoted to executive director of design, yet another first for an African American, and one step from VP of design. In that role, I was responsible for the design of all GM trucks, including everything from Hummer to Chevy, GMC, and even Cadillac Escalade. I also led all strategies for GM show cars. My experiences, both good and at times very challenging, and frequently taking me way out of my comfort zone, prepared me for the very next step. I was named GM Vice President of Design in 2003. Only the sixth person to hold that position. And as the head of design, I felt as though my principal assignment was um, to be responsible for the aesthetics of everything in General Motors. And I needed to provide an environment in which designers and sculptors felt free to create and come forward with their best ideas. A great example would be the day in which uh, one of our designers, Bob Munson, not an executive, just one of the designers in the studio, a very talented designer who worked in a Cadillac studio, approached me with an idea for a CTS coupe. I supported the idea, that sketch was really cool. I supported the idea and along with John Manugian, who was the chief designer of Cadillac Studio, put in place a team to develop his idea from sketch to reality. This award-winning design was not the product of extensive market research and product planning, but the creative mind of one designer. And by the way, he also approached me with the idea of a CTS wagon, which has become a modern day classic. General Motors had divisions and operations around the world meeting the automotive needs of customers in over 140 countries. Those operations around the world operated independent of each other at the time, including their own design teams. As a result, a Buick designed in China was totally different than a Buick designed in North America. Chevrolets designed and engineered in Brazil were totally different than Chevrolets in America. There were actually 27 different designs for the Chevrolet logo around the world, the logo known as the bow tie. Every regional leader had their own idea and here in America, there are actually three different designs for the bow tie at the time. Uh, it was a significant waste of resources and blurred the images of the brands. And it was my mission to take this, to change this. And engineering had the same mission. My colleagues there had the same mission to make that kind of change. So under the strong leadership of GM Vice Chairman Bob Lutz, we made the change from independent teams around the world to global teams working together. Uh, those studios were in Germany, Australia, Korea, China, and Brazil, as well as the studios in California and our largest studio and design um, headquarters in Michigan. We later added studios in India and additional studios and relationships in China. Although we had 
we had the most incredible virtual tools allowing us to communicate and conduct design reviews around the world and still be able to get home in time for dinner. I firmly believe that those tools work best if you knew the people at the end or other end of the line. Therefore, we would give our people the opportunity to work in those variety of studios around the world. And I would visit those studios on a regular basis. I also realized that as the world got smaller and people around the world had similar, if not identical, needs in a vehicle, there might not be the need for as many studios in the future. This was 2005, and it was my challenge to get the many design studios of General Motors around the world to become one seamless design machine. The designers in these studios around the world were eager to be a part of this new global design organization, but the organizations that those studios had reported to were, to be honest, reluctant to give up their authority or their power over their designers. Plus, their leaders were not convinced in the ability of me and the organization in Detroit to lead design globally. But nothing like success can change that opinion. Among other things, the creation of the 2006 Camaro concept car changed the minds of many, if not everyone. Although there were those who were very skepti skeptical of a Camaro concept in a secret location deep within the design building in Michigan, I had a team of designers under leadership of Tom Peters develop developed a new concept. Even my boss, Bob Lutz, didn't know where the studio was. And when I took him to the studio, I took him on a very indirect route. The studio was named Studio X. I took him on a very indirect route so he could never find it on its own. Uh, the team, I mean, it was because the team really needed to be able to work without any interference from anyone. Bob Lutz totally understood, respected it, and actually thought it was kind of cool that I would, had this hidden uh, studio. By the way, Studio X had quite a history just in a period of time that I ran design. Uh, we used it not only for the Camara project, we used it for some Corvette work and we developed the uh, presidential limousine known as The Beast in that secret studio, working with uh, Secret Service. As the Camara Concepts uh, design developed, there was a call from Chevrolet Marketing to, uh, for me to show my secret Camara to Michael Bay, who was looking for something special for Bumblebee in the Transformers movies that he was creating. He, he wanted to see the car. And, you know, anything I knew about, I, I really didn't know Michael Bay. And I only knew Transformers from the toys and the cartoons that my son used to watch. So I didn't want to show him the car until he told me about the movie. And he didn't want to tell me about the movie until he saw the car. Back and forth, back and forth. And I admit, I gave in. I showed him the car. He told me about the movie. And Michael and I worked together on all of the Transformer movies from then on. And in fact, he would not get far into the development of one of his movies without visiting me at design. And we'd walk to studios looking for new vehicles for Transformer movies. I actually had a speaking part in the fourth Transformer movie. Um, our team now had the job of building a silver Camaro concept for a Detroit Auto Show, as well as a yellow Bumblebee Camaro for, of the same design for Transformers. The entire project was secret, 
until we revealed the silver Camaro uh, at the show. Camaro fans were there for, for the reveal and they had tears in their eyes. They just couldn't believe this reveal of the new, new car. At the same time, the, um, as the movie developed, you know, they, they had the reveal of that car. It was a brilliant strategy. Some might think it was a brilliant strategy to reveal the Camaro and then follow that with the uh, Bumblebee Camaro in the movie. Or maybe it was incredible great luck that we had in bringing, having the two at the same time. In any case, it was a lot of work and a lot of fun. The roaring success of Camaro provided, proved that Chevrolets could have passion, they could have energy, and went a long way in getting the support of the entire corporation behind this new global design organization which I had created. The Camaro project was followed by a series of concept and production cars which benefited from the combined resources of the global design machine. Creating the environment in which people felt free to create was critical to success. And having a great working relationship with the engineer, our engineering partners was key as well. Uh, for decades, the relationship between design and engineering had suffered, and therefore the cars frequently suffered or sometimes failed. It needed to be a relationship of mutual respect and open collaboration, and it needed to be watched very close. And I, probably the best example of collaboration, I think, in the entire auto industry is the Corvette team in which Corvette engineers, Corvette designers, Corvette racing, Corvette marketing, and Corvette customers communicate very well and at the end of the day is a brilliant automobile. I could not give this presentation without commenting, and I will at a couple other points in here, about the significant movement in the auto industry with SUVs. I totally get it, but I also see a future in which SUVs will evolve and evolve to a vehicle that is much easier for a lot of people with disabilities or elderly people can get in and out of them. I, you know, SUVs, you've got to climb up to get into sedans, you've got to fall down into I think there is a vehicle type that's somewhere in between that is probably that is not too far off on the horizon. In 2014, I was beginning to think seriously about retirement from GM, thinking that 2016 was probably best. I still absolutely loved what I was doing and loved the people I was working with. The design organization was strong. I had some very strong people reporting to me, people who had a wide variety of experiences, and I thought my job was close to being complete. I shared my thoughts with only two people at GM, the chairman of GM, Mary Barr, and my immediate sup supervisor, Mark Royce. They were supportive, but, you know, and surprised that I was ready to retirement, but they totally understood and we began the process of selecting my successor in total secrecy. I knew that as soon as the announcement would be made, uh, things would change. Therefore, the announcement wasn't made until the spring of 2016. I took a 40,000 mile world tour of my studios to thank the teams for all they have done. I must admit it was somewhat emotional at times. After all, these people at GM Design really meant a lot to me. Working at GM Design was 
my lifelong dream and the place where I had spent my entire adult life. But I was also excited about the future and new adventures. Following that global tour and just three weeks before my actual retirement, I traveled to Rome, Italy, where I had shipped my personal Z06 Corvette and began a drive which started with a photo shoot at the Colosseum. Then I was off to Tuscany, Milan, and Monza, the Temple of Speed. And then on to Torino, Lyon, France, Le Mans for the 24-hour race, Versailles, Paris, where I picked up my wife, Jessie, and we were off to the Champagne District of France, and then on to Goodwood. We took the channel to Goodwood in England for the Festival of Speed. Following a great weekend at Goodwood, it was back to Detroit, a final blessing of the design of the C8 Corvette, a great farewell party in my honor, turned in the keys to the office, and I began the next chapter of my life. I hate the word retirement. I just hate that word because, you know, I just, I associate retirement with a withdrawal from work. You know, you're off in the sunset, whatever, that kind of thing. I would rather say that I graduated from General Motors and now I'm putting into practice all that I have learned. You know, I had said to many people, including Mike, who's here, you know, I'm not going to be at home watching Judge Judy. There are things that I want to do. I can say it's been four years and I haven't seen Judge Judy at all since I, I don't even know if she's still on TV. But I, I, <clears throat> my first year after retirement in this new chapter was full of celebrations some travel and I, I received some spectacular awards, including the Eyes on Design Lifetime Achievement Award. I had uh, a gallery of the Detroit Institute of Art named in my honor, and my archives were placed in the Smithsonian Museum. But being inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame was the most incredible recognition that I could receive, and I treasure it. To stand among the le leaders like Nicio Bertoni, Harley Earl, Batista Farina, Tom Gale, Giorgetto Giugiaro, Chuck Jordan, Bill Mitchell, Sergio Pininfarina, and Jack Talnick. I mean, these are my design heroes. And I, I don't expect anybody to understand how emotional or how excited it makes me feel to stand among them. I still love automobile design, but I feel as though my interest in design has blossomed into a number of different directions since graduation. I have formed the Wellburn Group and I'm involved in a couple of very interesting, a number of very interesting projects. First is Bolt Micromobility. Yes, Usain Bolt. Uh, the company builds and rents electric scooters in many cities and they have asked me to be a design advisor to their team to give a design perspective on what they are doing and I'm deeply involved and where micromobility will take us in the future. It has become far more sketching for me than what I had planned, but it is so much fun. It's great. A couple of years ago, I did some work with uh, Shinji Takai. He is a major car collector in Japan. He won the Porsche Cup in that country and wanted to race a Corvette in the Suzuka 10-hour endurance race. Uh, so I worked with him in Callaway to bring this car to Japan. And uh, Jesse and I were there for the race. And it was, while we were there at the race, I was inspired by it, looking at the car and looking at the team's uniforms and thinking, 
you know, maybe there's an athletic shoe that they should be wearing that kind of matched what they were doing. So, but since then, I have been exploring a number of different directions uh, with possible luxury brands, and I'm keeping much of the work confidential, just showing just a couple little sketches. Uh, you'll just have to stand by to see what happens there. Okay, the next project is, is the big one, and it's probably the one that might be the most meaningful thing that I've ever worked on. I've formed Wellburn Media Productions and hired a team of writers, producers, advisors, researchers, and yes, lawyers. And we have a major film under development. We have completed phase one, which script is done. And we are now in communication with uh, film companies, potential directors and actors. I never thought, going back to that whole Judge Judy thing, that I would spend Saturday evenings going through contracts <laughs> with, with producers and directors, that sort of thing. I'm so excited about this project. It's based on a true story. I bought the movie rights to this true story, and this may be the most meaningful project of my life. I must say that I have couple other projects that are under development. I was hoping I'd be able to talk to you about today, but there's still confidentiality, or confidentiality around it. Uh, you'll all probably hear about it in a few weeks, I think. Uh, uh, let me close by giving you a few thoughts about the future of the car, of car design since we've got so many great car design students with us. I believe that there is an exciting future in which design will play a very significant role. In the 1930s, Alfred Sloan, chairman of General Motors, said that no brand will have a significant technology advantage for long. And at that time, he said no brand would a brand may introduce a self-starter or an automatic transmission, but eventually everyone would have a self-starter or an automatic transmission. But, it, but design would be the great differentiator in the marketplace. That was true in the 1930s, it's true today, and it'll certainly be true in the future. If all brands are electric and there isn't a significant difference in the propulsion system from one brand to another, design will be the great differentiator. Contrary to many of my car crazy friends, I'm excited about autonomous vehicles. Some people are afraid that autonomous vehicles will all look like eggs. Well, an egg may look better than some of the designs that I see in the marketplace today, to be honest with you. But seriously, autonomous vehicles will give people with disabilities the freedom to travel wherever they want to go, whenever they want to go. And will give designers the freedom to create a much wider bandwidth of vehicles than they have today. And this is so exciting to me. Now, this significant role that designers will have in the future has significant responsibilities that go along with it. There is no shortcut to preparing for a significant role or being a significant contri contributor in the future. Hard work, commitment to your craft, and having an open mind to change is very, very important for all designers. You need to have fun along the way too and have a very balanced life, and take care of your health as well. With that, I think this might be a good point for us to segue into a Q&A. Is that right, Brian? Let's start by thanking Mr. Wilkins. Thank you. 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 Thank you.